Anybody know what uh, movie my background's from? Nothing to do with Elf. Well, I guess it has something to do with Elf and Beta. No? That's, uh, let me pull back a little bit. I tell you, kids today, they don't know the greatest elements of culture. My favorite movie of all time. And I use this slide, um, you know, I've helped develop something called the reference condition approach to bioassessment. And one of the fundamentals of RCA is that there's more than one way for an ecosystem to be good, like in good shape. So I used to use this slide all the time because it's the final, or close to the final scene of Casablanca, of course. And uh, you can see uh, one, two, three, four, five people. And I'll, if you haven't seen the movie, you've got to see it. But there's five people in that scene, and they they are all good in very different ways, and that was the point I was trying to make. And in using that slide, anyway. Okay. All right. So let me. If everybody, I think everybody's back. Sorry, I can't. Yep. Okay. So let me bring up our rid of the slides. And I'll just confirm that you're looking at my R screen. Can somebody give me confirmation of that yeah we can see it emily you're pretty reliable uh, i guess i should turn up my volume <laughs> Jeez. okay now can you see my art yeah we can see it okay thanks Probably everybody said Casablanca a couple of minutes ago. I just didn't hear you, right? Okay, so let me go to Lab 2 scripts and I'll try to be as efficient as I can after promising to be fast. Uh, there we are. So the three things I want to show you are um, diagnostics for assumptions, homemade distribution, and uh, power analysis. So diagnostic for linear models, I, I put them all in the, everything from the t-test to the ANOVA, but I'll, I'll use the multiple regression one because I think that illustrates all three assumptions, maybe. So let me open up that. File. And what am I using? I'm using Mike's Chinook data here for multiple regression. If you look in the top left there, so let's just read in the data, make sure that it's happening. Okay, we got the Chinook data set. And I just spent a few lines just setting up titles and subtitles and access labels and stuff like that so we'll do that 
Man, I can already tell this is not. Oh, geez. For Pete's sake. So much. Sorry about that. I just was on the wrong script. Okay, back to multiple regression. Quickly read in the. Data set. Got it. Establish the variables I'm going to use and titles and stuff like that. And calculate a variable for an interaction term and a multiple regression. Seem to work OK. Fit the multiple regression. And you can see the results of the analyses, uh, the multiple regression analysis. So in this case, uh, the response variable is fork length, FL. The predictor variables were snout height, I think it is. Sorry, snout length, hump height, and snout times hump, like an interaction term. And you can see the hypothesis tests for them there. That's all great. Um, so let's get to the actual checking of assumptions. So first of all, I plot the residuals. So one of the things, as you can see in line 37, you can extract the residuals from whatever model you fit, just using the residuals function. So I fit the model up on line uh, 30. And part of what's sort of stuffed inside that variable called Chinook underscore MREG, that's the results of the model, are the residuals. And I just established some plotting terms there so that I can do a histogram of the residuals and overlay what the normal distribution would be like. So I can compare the histogram to the normal distribution with the same mean. So let's run that and see what happens. Okay, there it is. Beautiful. So you see the actual residuals, which just like I was talking about in the first hour, um, you know, the mean of zero, and you can see that the curve is the theoretical normal distribution. And basically, we're eyeballing whether or not that corresponds to an approximately normal distribution of residuals. And I'd say that looks actually pretty good. And so these are residuals. You know, from those three terms in the regression model, they're going to predict, together, they're going to predict a value of fork length. And this is the difference between the actual fork length of the fish and the predicted fork length. So some of them had a bigger fork length than predicted, the ones up here, some of them smaller. But the distribution is, yeah, it's pretty close to normal. And again, just yell at me if you see something that doesn't make sense or that you want to ask about. Okay, next thing I do is a QQ plot, as I was describing in the lecture part. And again, if if the no residuals are normal, I'm doing the QQ plot of the residuals, same thing I just built a histogram of. They should be along that line. And yeah, they're not bad. There's a couple down here that have much smaller values than expected if uh, it's a normal distribution of residuals. And that matches these two values here in the histogram. So it's good when you do this, flip between these two, that'll help you kind of see where the QQ plot is coming from. It's the same data in both. So I would conclude from that, yeah, that. Uh, normality of residuals, it's not too far off of that, this data set. Um, so homo homogeneity of variance and linearity. Let's see how I do that. In this case, to, just to generalize it, what you do is plot the residual value on the y-axis versus the predicted value on the x-axis. 
and you look for patterns, you look for differences in variability. So let's run that and see what happens. So as I said, y-axis is residual. So uh, bigger fork length than predicted is above the horizontal dashed line, smaller is below. Predicted value from the smallest predicted to the biggest. This is, use this rather than using like the quantitative predictor because we've got more than one quantitative predictor, right? So this generalizes the, the approach. So what we're looking for is up and down, do we see about the same amount of scatter no matter where we are on the x-axis? And again, I'd say, well, it's not hugely variable, the amount of variability. There does tend to be, in terms of um, linearity, there does tend to be, notice how all the, these ones out here at the lower end of the predicteds are all below the negative residuals. We don't, we don't see positives up here. There's just a few values at this end anyway, so I wouldn't freak out about that, but just something to notice. Again, if there's evidence of pattern there, that's indicative of nonlinearity in the relationships that you've analyzed. Um, finally, this plot of uh, observed versus predicted, and uh, I think you'll see the value of that. So, yeah, if, if observed equals predicted, the fish will be right on the dashed line. And this, again, is it's kind of like a generalized version of that, you know, y versus x for simple regression. And I just throw through the fish ID uh, on there and the lamprey attached to give me a little more information about who the weirdos are, like over here that I'm pointing to now, N54M, which uh, was a lamprey attached fish, you know, had much lower fork length observed than was predicted. So just, you know, it helps me might not end up in the paper, but it helps me kind of understand what's going on in my data. So the only other thing I want to do with this one is show you, because I asked you in the lab to do both the, um, the, the untransformed and transformed data. So let's do a uh, log transformation of the response variable and see how that affects the predictors. How do you do that? Well, um, is uh let me try this i think it'll work so for clink we don't have any uh zero values so i'll just try to use the log function in r and uh also um there's a way i'm forgetting now in r to um, concatenate two string variables. So I'm just going to leave the variable uh, labeled the same, but I'll put uh, in the subtitle. Um, log transform. So I'll add that just so we know. And I think that might work just like like that, but let's try it and see if it blows up. So yeah, a um, couple of cool things is um, over in the lower left uh, corner here. Oh no, I gotta do something else, sorry. Give me a sec here. I got to create, I got to do the log transformation before I uh, do everything else because I have to change the what's input into the uh, into the building of the linear model. So line 15 is going to be log 
underscore FL is log of fork length. And uh, I think that's what Yeah, okay. So <laughs> I'm quickly running out the clock, so I won't stop too long on this, but notice the plot. We're now dealing with the log of fork length in all of these plots. You know, the residual are residuals from the log of fork length. And the idea in getting you to do this in the lab is so you can just visually inspect it, it actually looks worse in terms of normality of residuals there, it's now trailing out on the low end much more than with the untransformed data. But that's what I want you to do when you, uh, when you look at the data, look at your data, I should say, with these is untransformed and transformed. And the best way to portray it in your lab too is to put side by side the diagnostics from each analysis. So you can judge, you can say, yeah, it looks like the transformation really helped adhere to the assumptions better. Um, or no, actually, if anything, they look worse. You know, whatever. You make your qualitative judgment. Um, but that's that's what I want you to do. <laughs> Sorry, I'm flying here. So if anything, you want clarification on anything, I'll be available if you want to shoot me a message next week while you're trying to finish up the lab. But let's quickly go to the homemade null, because this is so cool. And I may have mentioned this, but look at line 17. <laughs> um, so Ed Krynak, who was a former grad student of my grad student, Adam Yates, Western at the time, Ed took this course, and I, it used to be, remember I was telling you that you scramble up the, the response variable and then calculate it to you when you're building your own uh, homemade null distribution. So Ed created this R script, or at least a primordial version of it. So uh, you should thank him in absentia, because before that, students had to run in Excel. They did the shuffle, then they added a T value to a list, and then did the shuffle again and added another T value. So they kind of manually created the null distribution. Ed made it all happen automatically, so thanks to him. So let me, for this one, again, because of time, I'm gonna run it and then kind of show you what happened. Hopefully it works today. So there's the plot, and this this is probably more impressive. <laughs> you'll you'll learn how impressive this is as you learn more about building homemade null distributions. So in this case, getting back over to the script, um, I I randomized the data. This is just a t test between. Um, fish that had lamprey attached and those that didn't in terms of fork length was the response variable. And so a thousand times I scrambled the lists of fork lengths, mixed it up so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily beside the fish that it started with in each scramble, and in particular whether or not the fish had a lamprey attached. So this is creating a homemade null distribution corresponding to the null hypothesis that there's no difference between fork length of fish with or without lamprey attached. And so each value in this histogram was a T value that calculated from after a reshuffle of the data. And then the, the vertical dashed line is the T value corresponding to the actual data. 
And what it's showing you is, well, what was the chance, given the null is true, that's the distribution we're looking at, of getting that extreme of value or more if the null is true. And uh, so the homemade P, there's 13.5% of the observations are that value or bigger, the value we actually got. The parametric P, which is just doing a t-test the old-fashioned way, was very close to that, 0. 0.131. So that, that's building a null. And just before I leave that, so 1,000 is great. But what about, I don't know, let's do 100,000. So this is shuffling the data 100,000 times so that the null is true. You know, you don't have the, you don't have fork lengths lined up with the fish's uh, lamprey status, You're just shuffling it every time, calculating T, shuffle it again, calculate T. Let's do that 100,000 times. So I'll run it again. It's going to take a minute or so, given my, you know, it's a MacBook. I've got 47 other things going on. I think it'll come back in a little bit. So yeah, that you're you're seeing there, um, a, you know, graphic demonstration. And again, you can you can do this. Life gets slightly more complicated, but it's basically it's the same principle going on, where you build a distribution, which is your test statistic if the null was true, and then you have your actual test statistic from the data itself. That's this value 1.526. And you ask yourself, okay, what proportion of from my whole main null distribution did I get a value of 1.526 or more extreme? So that's all that's going on. And uh, the same thing is done in, I don't know, multi-way ANOVA, regression, things like that when you're testing a hypothesis with randomization of the data. And meanwhile, it's still working. So I think we're going to wait a sec for it. my fan is buzzing away because I'm uh, moving a 60 gig one drive from one place to the other so it, it's got that going on in the background so that might be affecting us here in the meantime I have a question about the multiple regression yeah uh the final plot that you showed us where it showed that line of the predicted and the observed i was just wondering so how does snout height tie into this and the other variable as well yeah so to look at their and i think i can i can go back here you could go further into them that if you go back you see this anova table here i think that's flavia um but in addition to the ANOVA table, and I hope you can see it now in the in the lower left, the console. So you see estimates of coefficients there and t-tests on those estimates of coefficients, which is telling you the roles that snout hump and the snout hump interaction are playing in predicting the, uh, the fork length here. So again, there's there's a whole other world in terms of it's kind of like when we talked about judging the interaction and the main effects in a two-way ANOVA that going into each of those and saying and asking the question are they do they seem to be affecting the response variable is the interaction important which the interaction in this world really just translates into is the effect of snow that that estimate that you see here, which is point, whoop, 
sorry, it just completed the uh, 100,000. So that, that's the way I would do it if, you know, for, for your data set, when you're looking at the results of that multiple regression, look at those, look at those terms, look at the uh, coefficients for your different predictor variables. Yeah, here I'm just Sounds really good. talking. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying thank you. Okay. Uh, so yeah, there's the, finally you see how the y-axis has changed <laughs> in our plot. We've got uh, going up to 25,000 observations there. Um, but basically we're just getting more and more decimal places of about the same place in the homemade null distribution. Okay, so really quickly <laughs> in five minutes and and it's unfortunate that I've yammered on this long because uh, this plot, this is the kind of plot what I'm about to do. Everybody's gonna generate the same plot, which is nice. You can't, you don't really tweak the power analysis plot for reasons that will be obvious in a sec. It's the kind of thing that I would make and then um, think about for a while. You really have to ponder. So let me just do it. I'll show you because all you have to do really is run this. You don't have to put in your your variables or anything like that because this is really calculating alpha and beta for different sample sizes um, and different effect sizes. So so let's run it and I'll show you what happens. I mean, a really super cool plot. So I'm going to say just a couple of things about it, but I want you to, yeah, run it and think about it and then get back to me with questions if you want to ask them. Because the, the trickiest thing about this question, I think it's the last question in the lab or something like that, is is really stating to me what you think an important correlation is between two quantitative variables that you have. So, and that's the x-axis here is like the effect size. So when you're testing a correlation between two quantitative variables, the null hypothesis is that that rho, which is the sort of population parameter for little r, is zero. The correlation is zero. So what you've got along the x-axis there is like effect size. So let me just run up one um, one spot on the x-axis, and I think that'll give you kind of start to give you the idea. But if you get screwed up or mystified by it, just get in touch and I'll try to clarify it for you. So if I decide in my research, it's really important for me to, to detect a correlation of 0.2. So R equals 0.2, that corresponds to R squared equals 0.04. So, you know, small correlations important in my world in this, whatever system I'm studying. So, in this case, we've got a sample size of 100. So 100 observations of two quantitative variables. I'm doing a two-tailed test, which means R might be, the correlation might be plus 0.2 or minus 0.2, okay? Either way is a relationship between the two variables that I wanted to detect. So as I go up here, the, the y-axis, is alpha, which is sometimes called significance, but so we've got alpha going from zero to one. And remember, alpha is the chance of a type one error. And the standard type one error to use, which I have as a blue, I think it's blue dashed horizontal dashed line there is alpha equals 0.05. And then alpha 0.1, is another, people sometimes use that and say, oh, it was marginally significant or sort of significant or whatever. So what I'm trying to show you here, and I'll show you with alpha 0.05, see these different colors of lines represent different betas. So beta is with this first line is 0.5. See the little box up in the top right here? You've got one minus beta, which is the other word for that is power. So beta is my chance of mistakenly uh, accepting the null hypothesis. And power, which is one minus beta, 
is my chance of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis. That's why it's called power, my power to detect. So my power and beta are equal to 0.5 when alpha is 0.05. So that's great. So I'm, I'm giving myself a 5% chance of mistakenly rejecting the null, but I'm giving myself a 50-50 chance of mistakenly accepting it. So if I used alpha 0.05 here with n equal 100, I'm saying that, that uh, avoiding type 1 error is 10 times more important than avoiding a type 2 error. And let, let, let me go up to here just to show you this curve here corresponds to power is 0.9, so beta is 0.1. And alpha is like point, looks like about 0.45. So in this case, I'm saying, well, beta is four times more important for me to avoid. And, you know, it's I'm making it a fourth the size of alpha. So what I want you to see here when you start to decode this this graph for your lab is that trade-off at a given sample size, the trade-off between alpha and beta when you're at a certain effect size that you deem to be important. That's what you're trying to see here. And you can see that things collapse as that effect size gets bigger and bigger because you know if that's there, you're not going to miss it. It'd be very hard to miss it, make a, make a mistake that way. Um, so take a look at that. Try to wrap your head around it and get in touch with me as you, as you start to, and happy to chat with you or get back to you via email on that. Okay, and all of these scripts are there in that same uh, download folder now, up to date with what we've just done, including the log transformation. Um, get in touch with me if, if the uh, link doesn't work for you, and I'll just send you back a fresh link, okay? Thanks and sorry, I uh, promised it would be fast today and I broke my promise. <laughs> so I'll see you, uh, I guess I won't see you next week. I'll see you the week after next. Cheers.